Mm. Okay. Mm. We're all back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Learning Space. I am Nicole Gallucci. I postdoc with the CosmoQuest Citizen Science Project, and I have with me my co host. Through the magic wall. Mm, hello. <laughs> George, Not far away at all. Not far away. Right through the wall. Right through the wall. Georgia Bracey, uh, our uh, education lead over at CosmoQuest. Uh, so we are going to talk today about some astronomy animations and simulations. This is kind of wrapping up week three of our favorite stuff <laughs> show series, which uh, we talked about our favorite constellation stories, and we talked about our favorite astronomy apps. Now we're going to talk about some astronomy simulations. I didn't we were doing a series. I didn't what either. It you know? just kind of worked out that way. Uh, we will be uh, back with our long-form interviews, as some of you have been asking, uh, next week through. We have a whole bunch of really, really interesting interviews uh, set up with cool people through February and March. We'll be talking about all kinds of things like spectroscopy you could do in the classroom and citizen science and microbes in space and, and uh, globe at night and all kinds of cool stuff like that. So stay tuned for those through February and March. We'll be posting uh, those show dates on our CosmoQuest page on Google+. Uh, but now we are going to be talking about uh, some favorite simulations. I apologize to the podcast listeners. This may not be as exciting for you guys as it would for the video. So we do encourage you to check out the uh, the video version of this on our YouTube page, which is, uh, the channel is called Astrosphere Vids. And so you can see all of our past episodes there. If you're watching right now, be sure to comment. Uh, let's see, comment on... I set up a usual uh, event page. I know we ditched them for the Weekly Space Hangout, but I, I still set one up for, for this show, uh, at least for this week. Uh, on the, uh, what's this, the Hangout event page or using the Q&A app. So any of the, the Google Plus places where you can comment, you can leave a comment, say hello, ask a question, uh, and I will tr share a couple of links throughout the show there as well uh, so you guys can follow along and see what we're playing at. Um, am I missing anything? Um, it seemed like we were going to announce something. I don't remember what. <laughs> oh, Cosmo Academy. Oh, you thank you. Cosmo Academy thank you. Start? Yes. Oh, I wanted to do a quick promo for Cosmo Academy, which has its own cool, shiny URL now, uh, <laughs> cosmoacademy.org. Uh, it redirects you back to CosmoQuest page anyway, but CosmoAcademy.org will take you to a listing of our online classes that we have available starting uh, in this new semester. So you can join us for fun and learning. Uh, one of these Google Hangout classes, they are mm -hmm. private Hangouts, so they're limited to eight students each. So it's you, a few students, an instructor, learning about some fascinating topic in astronomy. Uh, the ones we have coming up are um, Introduction to Astronomy Color Imaging, uh, we have an introduction to dark matter that'll be taught by Dr. Matthew Francis, Dr. Mr. Francis, and uh, I will be teaching a life in the universe uh, course. So that's a short four session course. Uh, a little bit of uh, what I taught when I was a grad student at University of Virginia about astrobiology. Uh, so we've got those coming up. We're gonna um, possibly run some more cosmo, uh, some more astronomy 101 type stuff in the future. So check out Cosmo Academy. It's a bunch of new classes that are open for registration now. Uh, hopefully we'll have Emily Lactawalla back for her class as well. I know she did another uh, how to find cool, yeah. how to find and manipulate cool space images. And that yeah, was imaging. super popular. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that she can come back and do that. So there's the link I'm sharing with you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, so Cosmo Academy, check it out. We have show, we have classes. Uh, thank you for that reminder. <laughs> I knew it was something. I forgot to put it in the spreadsheet. <laughs> so that's what happened. Uh, another thing we just talked about briefly. We are thinking about changing the time of this show. Not next month, not the month after, but uh, starting possibly in April. Uh, we wanted to try an earlier show time, um, which is made possible by my new quieter office, and um, so which will uh, hopefully be a, a nice evening time for our European viewers and hopefully get more uh, more guests who, who uh, come coming from mm -hmm. Europe um, who will have uh, a better time. So we're, we're thinking of doing an earlier time in April. Uh, I hope that does not uh, exclude anyone who, who currently watches, but that'll be a nice earlier time for you guys. Uh, I think that's it for announcements. Announcements. Yeah. Um, so, Georgia, you found this cool website. Uh, you were searching for something, and we can't remember. I know. We were just talking about this. I don't remember how I found this website. 
I was looking for something, <laughs> something with astronomy, and somehow I came across this list of really cool simulations, all have to do with astronomy, um, and I thought, man, this looks like fun. I need to do this later and play with these things. So it's now later, and it's it's later. So um, these are a whole bunch of astronomy apps coming out of the University of Nebraska Lincoln, um, and they apparently have this whole great big wonderful project um, surrounding a whole list of simulations. Um, they have, they also have lots of teaching materials and actual labs set up to go with these. So if you want to just grab, you know, the simulation itself, that's great. But if you're thinking of using simulation um, in your teaching. Uh, and you want to put in the classroom um, in one of your own activities, or you are looking for an activity that's already created and it has a simulation as its core. Um, there's a lot of great stuff here. So um, oh, it's astro.unl.edu slash NAAP, which is oh, okay. the Nebraska Astronomy Applet Project. Cool. That's Very cool. I shared um, the link just, to the animation space. This is a happy accident. Yes. Um, so yeah, and you know, for the people that are listening to the podcast, you know, you can <laughs> grab some of these maybe while you're listening and follow along at home later. There you go. Follow along at home. Ah. Yeah. So we'll put the link in the show notes for that as well. Um, I put a link to the animations page. So these are really uh, useful in astronomy in particular because you have to do a lot of deal with a lot of concepts in three-dimensional space, especially when you're talking about observational astronomy. Um, yeah. it's, it's or, or speeding things up in time. So you have to talk about changing seasons, moon phases, um, the way retrograde motion happens in the sky for the planets. And these are things that take a long time to happen, days, weeks, <laughs> months, years. Uh, <laughs> Precession, hello, 26,000 years. Um, and so it's good to speed things up, show a, a simulation of it happening, and show the three-dimensional perspective um, from, from an outside viewer. So sometimes it's really useful to have hands-on demonstrations, and sometimes it's easier just to pull up uh, a simulator to, to take a look at these things and uh, actually yeah. be able to do and, and safely do little experiments with things like black body curves. So again, this is really like if you, you're really rushed for time, don't have time to do a full hands-on lab or demo. Um, this is a really good thing. or This is a really good thing to insert into lectures to break up the lecture um, or have students look at it all on their own. Yeah, yeah. So you can use them. I mean, they, they're great just for a little demonstration if you just want to show how something's working, a certain system. Um, or a certain process, you know, that's great. You can just put it up there as an animation. Um, but they also allow you to modify certain variables. So you could set students on this and give them some things to actually do and try out and see if they can come up with some sort of pattern that's happening, some sort of idea, uh, just by playing around with the simulation. So uh, it can be used in a number of different ways inside the classroom. And these are all, well, I shouldn't say all. I haven't gotten even halfway down the list of them, I don't think. Uh, lots of simulations, but they're very um, user-friendly, very easy to pull up, um, and you can just kind of start playing with them right away. Yeah, so here's, a, here's an easy one. Let me see if I can uh, screen share and talk at the same time. Always a fun challenge. Mm. Uh, apparently not. Click the button. Click the button. Oh. Are you having any? <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and try one? Because I'm having <laughs> fail. Um, sure, I will try one. All right, let me put up. So I love. I don't. Well, so I used to teach fifth grade, right? So I kind of gravitate towards some of the simpler ones that are more observational. Like you could go out and actually look at the night sky and see some of this stuff in a way. Um, but one that I'll try to show here, I can make it happen. Is Please called, tell me your screen share is working because mine is not. And um, that is really sad. That's very sad. It does not seem to be. It's not working for you either? Oh, hey, Google. All right. Well, hold on. How descriptive can we be then? <laughs> and use your imagination. Um, that one. Okay. <laughs> this is called. The cold right, analog. Very good. Because yes, I think it's yeah. sure to work. Uh, this is an example of a really simple one. This is the balloon inflation to 
uh, show you, give you an analog, I guess an example of, of the expanding universe and what it's like for all the galaxies in the expanding universe. Uh, so as the universe, aka the balloon, expands, so if you don't actually have a balloon, you can show this, look at that, inflate mm. all the little coins on the balloon. Uh, get further and further away from each other. And so that is a, a really simple, easy demonstration of um, how galaxies actually uh, get further apart from each other. This is going to be really dizzying. I'm so sorry. I know. <laughs> galaxies get further apart from each other due to the expansion of the universe. Um, so that, that's one easy, simple example, the balloon universe that's yeah, on that that's UNL page. Great. That's good. Um, well, I don't know. So I'll just describe the one I was going to show, I think. Because I don't have a cam that I can, you can take off. I don't know how easy it would be for you to pull it up real quick, but but what it shows. Tell is me which just, one it is. It's um, Big Dipper 3D. So this has to deal with the idea that the constellations we see are not real patterns out in the universe. So um, what looks like a Big Dipper or a plow or whatever you imagine it to be. Um, if you were to travel way, way out and go out and try to get even closer to any of those stars, you really wouldn't see that pattern because the stars are not just plastered on some sort of celestial sphere out there and all the same distance from the Earth. They're all at different distances. So what Nicole is demonstrating for you right now is that with this simulation, you can just take your mouse, click, and drag this picture around and it will show you, shows you the Big Dipper, but it also shows you the relative distances of the stars from the Earth. So it's as you're... It's like W now. Yeah, it does. It looks like Cassiopeia now. Cassiopeia. Wait a minute. So as you're dragging this around, you can see it from all kinds of different angles, and you can see that what looks from Earth to be a Big Dipper, um, yeah, looks like Cassiopeia from some distances and some angles and just a random group of stars from other angles. So that's a very simple, nice, easy one to demonstrate that idea. So you can now do this. Click and drag. Yep. You can do this in, in analog physical space. Um, yeah. if I, I've seen this done with a little uh, box, kind of a box with one side cut away, and strings throughout the box. And you could put the beads on, the, on places on the strings that from one orientation it looks like the yes. constellation as we see it but then you can move it around and actually um, see that uh, I remember my friend Genevieve de Messier who now works in the Smithsonian um, yeah. did that one made one of those for Dark Skies yeah. for kids. Yeah I know someone who tried to do that um, I think she was successful in her classroom so just hanging things from the ceiling so that and the scale wasn't exactly right or anything but mm. from like far away on one end of the classroom you know you would see the Big Dipper but then as you walked around um, you would see all the different patterns that look nothing like the Big Dipper um, hanging from the ceiling. Yeah. So yeah, these you know these are just one kind of model. These simulations. So um, you know you may have like Nicole said an analog way, uh, you know, more kinesthetic way to get people moving and looking and doing these simulations. But um, but if you you know for whatever reason don't have the time or you want to send a student you know independently and take a look at this, they can look at it at home, it's just really easy, really easy to get to, easy to use. So we have a couple of questions and comments. Uh, first of all, Jamie Orlando wanted to make a comment on last week's show. I think I saw your comment on the blog, which I, I still need to add to our blog post. Uh, last week we talked about uh, astronomy apps, and Clear Sky Droid is the name of the Android app for the Clear Sky Chart website. So I'm really excited. I will add that to our blog over on CosmoQuest Educator Zone. Um, we yeah. have a question from Rolex Gamer. How can you make astronomy animations? These animations all appear to be made in Flash. Um, I don't know much about the construction of them themselves, but that might be something that they talk about um, on the website in general that you saw. There was certainly some information about the program. I don't remember seeing anything about um, how to actually mm -hmm. build the simulations themselves. So, but I admit I didn't. I didn't look for that. Right. Neither <laughs> so, neither of us are, uh, are, are necessarily uh, programmers. So, no, <laughs> like, I was if say we had that, Joe actually, on, probably the last thing. I've yeah, ever... yeah. But um, you know, what's like they're all built in Flash. That's a great question, and again for. Um, you know, if you have a student that really gets into these, you know, they may want to try to build their own somehow. Mm -hmm. And 
Boy, that would be wonderful, but I, I do not know where you'd even begin to start, but I'm sure yeah. somebody does. So you'd be using, for, for, for these examples, they, they used uh, some Adobe, uh, Adobe software to build, uh, I guess Adobe Flash okay. Professional, to build these simulations. Um, the, and like I said, this is a great, uh, this is probably a great great project for a college student doing computer science or astronomy or education. Mm -hmm. You can really work it into to any of those things. Yeah. Yeah. So lots so, of possibilities. There's another uh, one that I like. Uh, I'm going to skip over to you so I don't make people dizzy for a second. Okay. Um, which is the, the retrograde motion one. And this one, because this is one of those concepts when I was a, gosh, freshman? Freshman astronomy kid? Uh, <laughs> that I really did have to see in motion before I could understand what was going on. This is about the retrograde motion of the planets, the um, Mars in particular. Mars chugs along on its trajectory through the constellations until at one point it backs up. It goes back, you can kind of see my reflection, it goes backward, it backs <laughs> up a bit. This is really meta. Um, and that was difficult to explain in a geocentric model of the solar system. And so the heliocentric model makes it pretty obvious why Mars seems to go back and forth in the sky if you plot its position over several nights. So let me hit start. We have Earth and Mars going around the sun. In the solar system, it's going in one direction, and now it slows and starts to move backwards. Again, this is plotting its position night after night. This is what you would see over the course of many months. And then it slows. So if you're just looking at Mars in the sky, it's doing this wobble back and forth. And, and you know, early astronomers were like, I don't get, we're going to keep adding <laughs> epicycles and deference and epicycles. And they kept adding all these complicated circles um, to, to the orbits around the Earth. Uh, but it was it was it was solved pretty simply um, by putting the sun at the center of the solar system, and this is uh, again you would need many months to track this in the night sky and pay attention to where Mars is, plot mm -hmm. its position over time through the constellations to actually see this motion. And then in this simulator, you can see its motion all mm -hmm. at once and get the outsider view of the solar system and and see what that These looks simulations like. Simulations make you feel really powerful and and all. <laughs> yes. All controlling and yes. we have these powers. I can speed up time. I can go back in time. I can transport myself out to a pulsar. Can look at a black hole. Um, there's an epicycle simulation too on the list for this, mm -hmm. but I didn't look at it. And I thought, Ooh, that, that, might get, that might get confusing. They have some what they call historical simulations. I think is the category. Okay. So. Um, and I, I so, think. Yeah. Um, and, you don't have to go out in the cold either. Yes. <laughs> yes, I did that the other night. Uh, we're having. <laughs> so, um, yeah, simulations. So we're talking about educational simulations, things that are already built, um, already been made. But uh, something funny you say about feeling like all powerful. Um, <laughs> some of my friends who are theorists who create scientific simulations, things that actually test physical properties. And then Christian disk around a black hole, for an example, where we can't go and sample and push and prod at things. They can build a simulation. This is a much uh, more detailed, mathematically rigorous simulation yes. to understand the physics of what's happening in an accretion disk around a black hole, for example. Um, and so that is uh, another type of simulation we're not necessarily talking about, but I wanted to bring that up because my, I, my theorist friends do get to play God within their <laughs> computers <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah. making their little universes, which is pretty fun. Yeah. Well, it's another, it's another kind of model. It's another purpose to have a model, and it's a good thing. You know, as you go through any of these simulations, you know, they all have, they have pros and cons as far as, you know, what they're showing um, or maybe what they're not showing exactly correctly, and it's a function of what kind of, of model it is. Um, they all have one particular thing or a couple of things maybe that they're showing really well, and that's their purpose. And so sort of to balance that out, you know, it's, there's probably other things about that model that are not quite as accurate. And it's a good thing to talk about because a lot of pictures and diagrams can generate misconceptions with students because it's hard to show absolutely everything accurately because it's a model. Um, you know, there's some scale differences. There's you know, you are speeding up time, but of course, you know, really that doesn't happen. And that's just good things to talk about because, um, as you said, Nicole, getting into more sophisticated models and simulations that are actually, you know, useful for science, um, that is something that, you know, in high school, getting older and into college, that students will start to deal with. And it's very helpful if they've kind of had this idea 
all along of some of the limitations of models and simulations, um, how to spot them and, and ignore them sometimes if they need to. Here's a great example. Oh, did, of okay. such misconceptions. Every lunar phase diagram ever shown in a textbook has the moon and the earth really close to each other and not quite to scale. And, and uh, some of these, so, some of these actually, this one isn't so bad, some of them have the moon almost the size of the earth um, <laughs> in its simulations. And so, yeah, you can get an incorrect um, idea of scale by watching uh, mm -hmm. this particular animation or by looking at uh, certain... Oh, certain uh, textbook images that show you that, but you do get another um, way of learning this. So, for example, you've got, I love this little person the on the earth. Human. The human spinning on the earth is, <laughs> is the key part of this simulation because, again, they don't show that in the textbook. And so you want to know where you are when you see the moon and why you only see little bit of it lit up. So if you look uh, over here, you might only see a little a crescent phase. While the sunlight, there's a lot going on. And this is a much more uh, detailed animation. You have the sun shining on the moon, lighting up half of it. Half of it's in light, half of it's in dark. You have a person on the earth spinning round and round. You have what they <laughs> see in the sky. You have the earth and sun they see in the sky. There's a lot to unpack in this particular animation. Um, but you can talk a lot about a lot of different aspects of, say, you know, why we see the lunar phases as we do, why there's no one dark side of the moon. I'm not sure how well this one actually shows that, but that's a possibility. And why the sun and the moon appear at certain points in the sky uh, above you, or I guess not in the sky that below you. So you can slow down the animation, right? Can I? That one. Whoa, there we go. Bark, dark, dark. And you can, what else was I looking at? You can show the angle. Where's that? So, you uh, put right so that kind oh. of shows the angle between the moon and the sun, which is, is kind of helpful for trying to visualize what's going on. So at different, so you know, full moon, it's about 180 degrees, and then 90 degrees at um, the quarters, zero at new moon. Just another way to help you kind of picture it. So yeah, that one has a few more features to it. The interesting Some question. Ones. The interesting question is is um, and and I didn't look too much into the research on this, but it, a lot of people are looking at you know how does this compare to, for example, I mean lunar phases is is uh, such a, a key example in astronomy of something that seems to be in a lot of the education standards, and it's just. A heck of a concept to get your brain around the first time, the first few mm -hmm. times you look at it, um, and and a lot of people still stick by the ball and stick model. So you know you hold up, use my microphone mm -hmm. as an example. You hold up, you know, a ball, <laughs> and you have a flashlight, and you move it around your head, and that's your uh, model. A lot of and and that seems to make it click for a lot of people. And so I think the interesting thing to look at is to compare. Pause that; it's distracting me. Uh, compare. Um, the, you know, the analog 3D move-it-yourself model mm -hmm. with the textbook images, with the animation. Um, and, and I think, I think it's, it's been shown that, you know, these uh, animations are one good step above looking at an image. Um, and then doing something in three dimensions for, for certain people, uh, for certain populations, it's one step up above, above that. Mm -hmm. So this is somewhere, I think, in the middle. Uh, in terms of being able to get across these difficult geometrical concepts. Um, yeah, and if you do, depending on how far you take that activity, um, um, it's the movement of, you, you know, your own movement as you manipulate things, um, as you turn the, the little ball on the stick and you move yourself around to simulate new moon and full moon, um, you're actually, you know, you're moving. You're not just watching, I mean, you see it in 3D, but you're interacting. It's a much more interactive model and that makes a big difference also. So um, you we were talking earlier about this you said there's some so ta speaking of K-12 education <laughs> there are some um, science standards in the next generation science standards coming up that this actually has has good application to these, these types of simulations. Yeah a big part of so for the United States, the next generation science standards are the, the next big thing coming. Um, some of the states have adopted them, probably more will. Um, you know, too soon to say if everybody will, but they are, they are a big thing. And there's several, um, several great things about them. 
Um, but one of the aspects of them is they have a list of science and engineering practices that are to be emphasized all throughout um, education, all levels. And so one of the science and engineering practices is to use and develop models. And there's several things. Are you looking at I the big scary tables? Lost my big scary table. <laughs> It went away from me. Um, so there's several suggested things uh, that you can talk about with models. So developing and using models is one of the practices. So even as early as kindergarten, um, they talk about how models are built off of your experience. You know, first you're observing, you know, a very basic model might show something that you just observe. And maybe, you know, that's simple enough, that's something to start. So maybe it's just a picture or a storyboard, a drawing, um, and then you know you begin by taking a look and comparing. Okay, here's the model. Here's the actual thing. You know what are the differences? What are the similarities? Um, so at that very early level, uh, you can start to talk about some of the aspects of different models. And then as you go through the grades, you know you get more and more sophisticated. Um, you talk about limitations of the models. Um, you talk about how you can revise a model to try to make it better. Um, students begin to develop their own models. And then um, as you get more sophisticated, like you mentioned earlier, by the time you're in 12th grade, you know, you're actually designing a model, testing it, um, looking at how, you know, how accurate is it, does it predict, does it accurate, accurately describe what's going on. Um, so there's that whole progression of getting more and more sophisticated just with developing and using models. Um, and that, so that's a very large um, kind of new emphasis with the science standards for the United States. So it's kind of interesting because these simulations are certainly one kind of model. And again, a really simple, easy way for teachers to just bring them in. You know, even if you don't have a lot of time and you just want to look and try one and talk about it, you know, you could easily do that in your classroom, um, you know, even at the last minute. Got a few extra minutes. Yeah. You have one of these simulations, because they're fun, and, uh, and there is a lot to talk about, and then you're learning whatever the simulation is about. So lots of good things for it. Um, so my screen share is still not working. I know, mine too. This is so sad. Kind of silly to expect it. it to just start working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'd probably have to like close it and come trying. back. Okay. Uh, I have an um, example of another one. A lot of say if you have another one, I mm -hmm. yeah yeah go ahead. Uh, a, a lot of astronomy textbooks um, come with their own simulations and interactions. So here's my 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 lamo <laughs> my silly little uh, webcam holding. Uh, this is an example from Astronomy Journey to the Cosmic Frontier. This is a textbook that's used for Astronomy 101 classes. And it's got a simulation, it's got a uh, simulator, it's, got an, it's another interactive one where there's lots of buttons and widgets and things to press. Uh, you can change the, uh, here's my Earth, you can move Earth, but there's my X instead of a little giant person, there's a little X saying where you are. Um, there's a, you can change the place of Earth's orbit, so time of year. Oh, nice. I change. love the thermometer. Look at that. Yeah, there's a thermometer. Really temperature. So you can change the inclination <laughs> angle of the planet. So you can. I had it set to around 23 and a half, which is what uh, Earth is. But you can set it to Venus's of two and Uranus of 86 in the other direction. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it gives you a temperature gauge. It's a very non-numeric temperature gauge, uh, and then also tells you. So if you get it going. Ooh. Uh, I wanted to go. There we go. Um, it gives you, if you have a little log cabin on Uranus, for example, <laughs> uh, it shows you where the sun goes through the sky. Uh, again, this is something that you actually may not realize until you go outside and measure the position of the sun with a sextant to the sky every day and see how it uh, moves through the sky throughout the uh, seasons. Um, but this little thing shows you the path of where the sun goes, and this is really bizarre because, again, this is on Uranus. This isn't what we're used to. I don't think it's ever going down. Um, yeah, for example, it's not even going down here, so the temperature's really hot. So good thing we're not tipped over on our side like that. Anyway, the thing I also wanted to show you, not just how fun the simulation is, um, but there are questions down here. 
So there are some multiple choice questions related to the interaction. Mm -hmm. So that's one way in which um, you as an instructor uh, can use the simulation and make sure your students are using the simulation if it's got some some question and answer aspect to it as well. And I don't know about this one in particular, but I know some textbook systems that I've used in the past um, relating to Astronomy 101 have uh, automated quiz banks and automated uh, homework sets with these simulations built in mm -hmm. that the students have to go through and then it gets graded and when you have a section with 500 students in it you uh, actually don't have to sit there and grade. It may or may not be the best assessment tool depending on what you're looking mm -hmm. for but it is one way to maybe get participation credit or to get some kind of homework credit for a huge lecture hall, a uh, huge lecture class in Astronomy 101 mm -hmm. and you know they actually have to play around the simulations at least a little mm -hmm. bit um, to get that going yeah. and to, to answer the questions. Yeah. So we have uh, uh, another uh, comment from Chris Kennedy. Have you ever seen Celestia or Space Engine? Uh, it's not necessarily educational, but gosh darn it, it's pretty. It gives you a size, scale, and distance. I have not used Space I have Engine. Not either. Uh, it's actually going undergoing a looks like a fundraising campaign right now because it is a free simulation software that lets you explore the universe in three dimensions. Um, I have used something similar, I think. Uh, what is it? Um, uh, brrr, uh, blanking on the name of the planetarium <laughs> software I used to use. Ah! Um, but uh, when I was had one of the digital star labs that I was using in Virginia, um, we had software that went along with that. It's not Stellarium, it's the other one. <laughs> not free, which is why I haven't used it in a while. Um, but there is, uh, it was a planetarium software that lets you kind of fly, you could actually fly through space, fly to Saturn, investigate Saturn's moons. It used Cass gorgeous Cassini images. That was specifically written for this planetarium software to be projected on the inside of a planetarium. But uh, if you had it in flat screen mode, you could still zip around the universe, and that's pretty cool. So I'm going to have to check that out. Thank you, Chris. Uh, space Engine. Mm, not Digital Sky. Mm. No, I'm completely okay. blanking on Very nice. the not free planetarium software. Uh, <laughs> and I think Celestia <laughs> is, is, is similar in that it's a planetarium software. Mm -hmm. um, that and, and be, It may not necessarily, again, it may not be pushing a particular educational concept the way that some of these other simulations are, but you get an immediate ooh pretty factor mm -hmm. from uh, getting to fly through space, uh, which is yeah. always good times. Um, oh, we have another one uh, from Tom Nathy, Scale of the Universe. This one, I, I think this is the one I've seen before. Yes, and it's loading, so I'm gonna. I guess. So if you haven't seen this already, go play Scale of the Universe. I'll share that link as well. Oh, I think you I see, see this one. one? Yes. Yeah. 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 This is fun, and th yeah, this one. Ooh, there's music. This one went uh, kind of viral a couple times. First time I saw it, and then it uh, when they redid it. And you can scroll through different size scales from the itty bitty bitty tiny things. So here we go: cells, mist, mist droplet. Yeah. The, oh, and you can <laughs> click on the thing, and it gives you its actual size. It can tell you what you're looking at. Look at a white blood cell. The mass murderers are known as leukocytes. I love it. I love it. <laughs> go all the way down to the tiny, to the atomic. Woo! All the way down. Gamma ray wavelengths. I like that it includes the electromagnetic spectrum in there. Yes, I just thought that was good too. And let's go out since this oh, yeah, is go way an out. astronomy show. Let's, <laughs> oh, there's a hair. There's an ant. Oh god! Oh, ant. There's a earthworm. Oh wait, there's something really creepy in here too. There's like a giant earthworm. Yeah, that giant earthworm, three meters long. This is where I learned that giant earthworms exist. Dinosaurs, houses. Um. Oh, Buildings. Let's, oh, look! We live there. Gateway Arch. Oh! I didn't know that was in there. And we are. There we go. Home. Now we're out to plant here. There's Asia. Asia is bigger than some of these moons here. That's impressive. Um, now we get out to these astronomical objects. Minecraft World! Oh my god. Wow, I did not know that. <laughs> I didn't see that before either. I th they've definitely been That's updating good. this. Okay. Now you get out to the star. So it, it's mind blowing because it's 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 a 
interactive simulation take on the, the planets of uh, powers of ten video. Yeah. And all that uh, video from way back when the powers of ten. Um, and so it's it's moving you through different size scales in a logarithmic way, which isn't necessarily the way our brains. Uh, my brain still can't capture that every time you move yeah. it's a factor of ten. It's not a linear scale. Um, but I'll share that link out. On. Yeah, that's a great video. It's, that's definitely a classic. Yeah. So so the powers of ten. This yeah. is, it's a, that's like an updated Web 2.0 version of powers of ten. Oh, is, is I the haven't scale seen of the universe. I think that yeah. Um, I have the VHS version. You have the VHS? <laughs> yes. That works. That works. But that's this one gets you let, lets you play with the slider and lets you do all kinds of things. Yeah, so so in that way, it is is more of an animation slash simulation thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and that's the cool yeah. thing about a lot of these simulations is you can manipulate some of the some of the variables in there, so you have more fun. All right. Oh, and uh, again, a recommendation from Tom for. Microsoft's Worldwide Telescope. I still have not actually installed <laughs> on my Mac, although I intend to just for this. Um, but Worldwide Telescope you can use on any system. Um, WorldwideTelescope.org. That is another super cool thing. Um, they've been developing animations and simulations within the Worldwide Telescope. Um, oh, videos, all kinds of interesting stuff. And this, is, again, is all available for free. Um, again, to develop, you do need to have uh, Windows installed on your machine, which is fine, because mm. your Mac can do it. Your Mac with an Intel processor can totally do it, uh, <laughs> to, to, to develop them. But then they also have all of these interactive uh, Milky Way simulations, um, all of these. Ooh, they all have sound, which is slightly distracting, <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll show you for a second. Um, this is an interactive Milky Way demonstration. Uh, ooh, can you guys see that? Nah, you guys, oh, it's so terrible. Ooh, all right. That's There's a Milky Way with my face in it, um, <laughs> but it's going through, showing you the Andromeda Galaxy. It gives you tours in a lot of ways. Now, are the simulations kind of built in? Can you click on things and get to a simulation, or is that like a... Um, Heart. I don't know. I haven't played oh. with it. I haven't done much except yeah, for some of the really cool ones. Look at that too much either. It looks great though. Beautiful. Andromeda Galaxy. It's showing me. It's showing me. It's the music is very distracting. <laughs> but it's very pretty. <laughs> very pretty. So so they've made some really pretty um, animations within Worldwide Telescope that you can play with. Um, there's spectroscopy. In the Milky Way, I think that lets you uh, play with different colors. I'm gonna break my screen if I try and open this. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's that's another cool place. And and what I like about those is they're all free. Oh, here we go. Spectroscopy interactive. You can actually slide up and down along the electromagnetic spectrum and see the Milky Way in different wavelengths. Oh, that's excellent. Um, and so, uh, in fact, uh, there's a similar app that did that too. I wonder if it's the same person. Um, but it gives you um, tells you a little bit about. Uh, the survey that it came from, the telescope it came from, and shows you what the Milky Way looks like. As if you had infrared eyes, or had radio eyes, yeah. or let's see what do we got. Hydrogen alpha line specifically. Uh, all super those powers. That's what they're yeah, doing. super eye powers. So, <laughs> though, yeah, and like I said, th those are all available for free, and it looks like they're celebrating their five-year anniversary, so rock on mm. Worldwide Telescope for your nice. five-year anniversary. All right. Five years. Five years. Mm. Uh, again, I'm a big fan because we we got to hang out. It was the last dot astronomy conference where we actually got to hang out at uh, Microsoft's research facility in Boston and uh, play with all their fun things. Play so, with the toys. Play with all the toys. Um, good. Very good. Do you have any any others? Um, no, we can't well, do much I was showing. looking at the Big Dipper clock. Mm. Yeah. That one. There we go. Sure. I'll bring that one up. You tell us a little bit about it. And this is again, actually I first saw this as a classroom project. This is something you can make and I know this is on the web in many different varieties. Some It's a star clock is the way I first heard about it. But it shows you how you can use the circumpolar, northern circumpolar constellations of the Big Dipper and Cassiopeia. Um, who, If you're in the right latitude, uh, never appear to set 
And so they appear to sort of endlessly circle around the Little Dipper and the Pole Star. So what you can do is you can actually tell time by the position of the Big Dipper and Cassiopeia around the Little Dipper if you also know the month of the year. So you can actually construct this little thing and use it as a clock okay. in a weird way. It's kind of fun. Not extremely accurate, but it gives you a sense. Um, and then this simulation uh, just lets you manipulate the, the month of the year, uh, the time of day, and you can see um, how the stars seem to circle around the pole and how that pattern repeats itself. Um, so you can see how it's different depending on the time of day, but it's also different depending on the season. So you can go cycle through all the months of the year and see that you know, 2 in the morning in January looks different than 2 in the morning in July and use that to kind of get a sense of what time um, it is if you wanted to go outside and use a star clock. And you can also um, set it to a certain time and that will tell you what those constellations will look like so you can actually, you know, if you want to see Cassiopeia, um, what's the best time and the best, best time of year to see Cassiopeia? When is it highest in the sky? And when is the Big Dipper highest in the sky for wherever you are? So um, that one, like I say, is a little activity you can actually construct out of paper, uh, color in, and put these two pieces of paper together and you have sort of a wheel on another wheel that you can spin around and you can show um, those motions of the stars and you can actually make that as a class activity. But this one, again, is just go to your computer and pull it up and you can take a look and see it, see it happen. So it shows you um, a nice way to look at the motions of the stars as they appear to rotate around or circle around the North Pole. Cool. I uh, have Star never clock actually or the seen big that. Dipper clock. I've never actually seen that before. <laughs> <sighs> That's always something to do. Well, cool then. Yeah, yeah. I've used I've I've used the old, moon. I've got old worksheets and things, but like I say, it's on. I've seen it a couple places on the web, and you can pull out things and I've, instructions. I've used like the moon and the sun to tell. Kids can make it. It's really cool. And then you know, kids can use it too because these are constellations that are pretty easy to find, and a lot of kids already know Big Dipper, and some of them know Cassiopeia, and um, at least in our part of the world, so. <laughs> It's, in our, in it's fun because it's a nice connection to the outside sky. Yeah. So that's I, it's one of my favorites. One so my favorites. I I've used like the sun and the moon to estimate time, um, but never constellations before. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, we have fun. a question, which uh, kind of did. How do you pronounce sidereal? Sidereal. Sidereal. How do you pronounce sidereal? Sidereal. I say sidereal. <laughs> I yeah. say sidereal too. <laughs> So sidereal is the timekeeping that you use. Mm -hmm. um, the solar day, for example, is uh, the 24 hours it takes the sun to go round to the same spot um, in the sky. Oh, I hope I'm not screwing this up. If you're looking at things in the sky, you watch the sun go around to the same spot in the sky that's a solar day. If you focus on a particular star um, and how long does that take to go around, that's 23 hours and 56 minutes, that's a sidereal day. Um, and so because we're... We're rotating and going around the Earth. Uh, there are two different types of day. This is kind of off topic, but that's fine. <laughs> I should have all motion and Don't get me started. I'll go off topic. But sidereal is, is at least how I pronounce it, um, and that is how uh, you keep track of sidereal time. Astronomers use sidereal time to uh, be able to tell what, what uh, coordinates, what things in the sky are up for viewing with our telescopes. Uh, and so as you'll see in a lot of observatories, a sidereal clock, which has a 23 hour, 56 minute period, not 24 hours. Um, and that'll actually tell you what time it is in sidereal time. So for your location. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> sidereal. Oh, and here's another one. Uh, Atlas of the Universe. I have not seen this, so I'm going to open this up and see what it is. Uh, oh, OK. Not either. And this is a, it's another uh, Atlas of the Universe is another powers of ten or in some cases twenty uh, s images looks like it's showing images of ooh I see it 
Oh, I see what it's doing. <laughs> <laughs> I will put I will put this I will put this link down for you. Um, it shows different images and showing where the nearest stars are around the sun, and then you zoom out twenty times and see more of the uh, stars around the sun, in particular um, all the types of stars you can see with the naked eye. Zoom out again, you see the um, you see the Milky Way. Uh, let me put so this is just atlasoftheuniverse.com. Mm. I have to admit it looks like some old timey. HTML is happening. It's still pretty awesome, so you can check that out. Uh, and that, I think, explains where I saw. Yeah, this is where I've seen uh, maps of the uh, Milky Way and the local group. So this is another fun thing. Uh, when I was taking a galactic astronomy class in grad school, we talked a lot about the dwarf galaxies in our local group. So if you zoom out, here's the Milky Way, our galaxy with everything in it. Here are the locations of different dwarf galaxies. So here's the large and small Magellanic clouds. Uh, I don't doesn't have oh it does have a scale 100,000 light years is this little bar here. Uh, here's the Sagittarius dwarf which is being ripped apart. Uh, it has these huge tidal tails and streamers around the galaxy. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of keep zooming out, zoom out again another 10 times. And here's more of the local group. Here's the Milky Way. Here's Andromeda. Lots more dwarf galaxies. So this whole web page looks like it's showing us, so thank you Tom for sharing that as well, that is showing us um, so where things, so again starting from the center, starting from the sun and moving outwards in powers of ten to see what's around <laughs> us in the universe so yay Excellent. for that um, I'm trying to see if there was another did you have another one? I, I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm kind of, yeah. Because our screen share isn't working, and I have to hold up the camera, it's it's less interesting. It's, um, so maybe you podcast listeners are not missing out on that much. Except me holding up a webcam to my own screen. Um, <laughs> That's fine. Um, I think we'll I wrap. Maybe we'll wrap this up. Uh, unless you had any other points on that. I think hitting the uh, the next gen standards and how it helps with that was was really cool. Um, try these out with your students. Try these out uh, with your K-12 students, your Strongy 101 students, or just goof around on your own like we've been doing <laughs> this week, checking these things out. Um, yeah. and, and see I want to say, you know, I just sort of happened to find this, um, so mm -hmm. thank you, <laughs> whoever is still at work developing and working on these simulations at the astronomy education um, place out at University of Nebraska. Lincoln and I just want to say again they have you go to their website there are lots of instructor resources um, other kinds of activities to use with these too they have ranking activities they talk about using think pair share activities so there is a lot of good things um, at their website so check that out because there's good stuff there yeah. excellent so thank you George's random googling for finding us <laughs> Some really one of my better awesome yeah, astro simulations. Google times, yes. This is totally going to be bookmarked and used <laughs> all the time. So, um, yeah. Uh, to do quick announcements uh, for Hangout schedule. Uh, Friday is the next Hangout. This is the weekly space Hangout hosted by Fraser Kane. That is at noon Pacific. Uh, we will be talking about top space stories from the week. I don't know which stories... We're going to be talking about yeah, because I haven't opened the spreadsheet yet, but I will probably talk about some cool uh, discoveries made with one of my favorite radio telescopes. So mm -hmm. check that out at noon Pacific. Fraser Kane and a whole bunch of us talk about the top astronomy and space news for the week. Um, Sunday night is the virtual star party. You may or may not discover a supernova. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. I think they missed their chance at that one. Did uh, they look can, at it last week? They, I think they did look at M82. Right. I wasn't around last week. I'm going to try and make it this week. Um, all right. For the virtual star party, that's at six Pacific, I think. That's like eight o'clock central, nine o'clock mm -hmm. Eastern. At least when it gets dark on the West Coast, where a lot of the telescopes are centered, uh, you can enjoy the beauties of the night sky from your warm home. And uh, I was out two nights ago with a telescope, freezing my hands off. So it's mm -hmm. definitely a good way uh, to check out the sky um, if you don't want to be cold. Um, Monday at noon Pacific is Astronomy Cast. Fraser, Kane, and Pamela Gay record a live episode of Astronomy Cast for about a half hour uh, on Google Hangouts, and then they take your questions. Uh, and then next week, we uh, will have Learning Space on Wednesday, same time and place, and we'll be talking about the World at Night project, which is uh, a project uh, photographing different interesting cool fun sites around the world at night 
astrophotography, landscape photography, all the cool stuff that you can Beautiful see around pictures. the world. Yeah. Yes, pretty more pretty mm -hmm. pictures. Hopefully, more I'll get screen share. I'll get screen share working by then. Huh. Oh yeah, oh, please. Hopefully. <laughs> so that'll be next week's learning space. Um, we forgot to mention, and some of you guys reminded us in the comments that last week was our anniversary. <laughs> So Learning Space turned a year old on January 23rd. The real reason I forgot is because it's my mother's birthday, and so calling her was more important. <laughs> Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Learning Space is a year old, uh, so mm. we've got a whole bunch of episodes um, back in our archives now at youtube.com slash astrospherevids. Uh, I'm working on a little... Um, Show promo, just highlighting some of my favorite. That yeah, is amazing. <laughs> from the year. And yeah, we've been doing it for a year, so pretty cool. Mm. Uh, thank you guys for the uh, anniversary thanks. wishes, even though we forgot to mention. <laughs> yes, well, thank you, Nicole. Nicole is the in the driver's seat, as you can tell. Beep, beep, vroom. Yep. Haven't crashed yet. <laughs> Look out. Haven't crashed too much. Job. So, yeah, we hope awesome. you can join us next week and through the rest of February and March. If you have a cool science or astronomy education project or idea that you want to talk about, uh, we are looking to fill out more slots for interviews because we love talking to fun people. So we are, uh, we, we will be starting to fill up new slots in April. So if you think you have availability then, let us know. Uh, you can email us at educate at cosmoquest.org. Right? Yes. That's one of our yes, email addresses. That is correct. That works. So, yeah, that is that is our show, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the awesome suggestions. I will put all of these links. Um, they're already in the comments on the event pages, but I will put them... You know what? I'll put them on the YouTube page as soon as that opens up. Okay. Uh, I'll make sure all these links end up there, and I know our... Uh, wonderful podcast producers will include them in the show notes as well. Yeah, awesome. We'll All have right. fun with these. There's have fun. So many we didn't mention either. So yeah, seriously, there's dozens and dozens on this website. So go, go have fun. Go, yeah. go be a god of your own universe. I know. Go travel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so it's much, everybody. Day. All right. Thanks. Good night. See you next week. Bye. Bye.